Greetings, students. I hope you're doing well, wherever you now find you. Today we want to start to think about syllogisms. Now, a syllogism is a special type of argument uh, that Aristotle came up with that has exactly two premises and one conclusion. And both of the premises and the conclusion must be standard form categorical propositions, our A, I, E, and O's and contain three different terms um, found in two different statements. Aristotle called these arguments syllogisms. Literally, he called them acts of reasoning, uh, since he thought that with his system, he had sort of grasped the essence of human reason itself. Calling, a, calling them syllogisms or acts of reasoning really makes sense. But we can think about the original meaning of the term and help us look at it in a kind of cool way. Now, syllogism in the Greek is the word syllogismos, right? and it's derived from a root word, syloge, which means a gathering, a collecting of something, a harvesting of something. It too, you see, it's got logos in there. It's like gathering the logos, and you can see how it too relates to lego, as we've talked about before in this idea of collecting or harvesting. So if we just give the most literal meaning of the Greek term syllogism possible, we could call a syllogism a gathering of thought. Now, in order to be a standard form categorical syllogism, it must meet the following requirements. In other words, it has to be put in exactly this format or it won't work. Again, uh, an analogy with computer programming. If you don't do it correctly, it will reject it through what it calls syntax error, and this is essentially the root of that kind of thinking. So to be a categorical syllogism, first, it has to consist of exactly three categorical propositions translated into standard form, just like we learned to do previously. So if you can't translate, you're going to uh, not be able to go any further, right? You have to be able to translate uh, statements in the correct categorical form. And in this kind of argument, two of them will be premises and the other one will be the conclusion. Now second, the premises must be in a certain order, with what is called the major premise first, the minor premise second, followed by the conclusion. Third, the subject and predicate terms need to be placed in a certain order. The term appearing in both premises, but not at the conclusion, is called the middle term. The subject term is called the minor term. And the predicate term is called the major term. Finally, the major premise is the premise that contains the major term, and the minor premise is the premise containing the minor term. Now, I know I've thrown a lot of stuff at you all at once, so we're going to go through it slowly and break it all down and try to make sense of it. And once you've studied this, you'll come back and be able to read this and just understand exactly what it means. Now first, just a kind of overview. I'm going to give you a broad overview and then we're going to go into the details. First, in a standard form syllogism, the major premise is always listed first. And the major premise contains what we call the major term, which is the predicate term of the conclusion. Right? So here we have the major premise. All living creatures are mortal beings. If you look at the conclusion, the conclusion is all human beings are mortal beings. That's, that's the predicate term of the conclusion, and so it's the major term. So the premise with the major term in it goes first. Now second, the minor premise contains the minor term, which is the subject term of the conclusion. Now here's the subject term of the conclusion, human beings, right? So the premise that has human beings in it, all human beings are living creatures, is the minor premise, and it goes second. Now third, the middle term is what connects the major term and the minor term together. It collects them and presents the harvest of the conclusion. And note that the middle term does not appear in the conclusion. So there's our middle terms. It's the one that will appear twice in the premises. Finally, 
the minor term in the minor premise then becomes the subject term of the conclusion. And the conclusion, human beings, right? The minor term is the subject. Notice also that we can now dispense with numbering the premises as we learn to do when putting arguments into standard form. Since a syllogism always only has two premises, uh, we just don't need to number them because we know uh, we'll have two. So I might ask you to identify the major, minor, and middle terms of some gatherings of thought or syllogisms. And what you keep in mind is the subject of the conclusion is the minor term, the predicate is the major term, and the middle term is what is left over in the premise. So when you're looking at a syllogism to sort of orient yourself, always look at the conclusion, right? So human beings, right? We have the, the subject term, so that's the minor term. Mortal beings, the predicate term, so that's the major term. And then what's left over is the thing that appears twice, which is living creatures. So if we look at this one, philosophers, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me again, it's Sunday morning and I've been drinking a lot of coffee. <laughs> philosophers is the subject term of the conclusion, so it's the minor term, minor term, major term, and lovers of wisdom is the middle term. See, I have to be able to just look at a syllogism and pick all that out, okay? So consider the following argument, which is not in standard form, and none of the statements are in standard form either. Mammals breathe with lungs, and whales are mammals, so whales breathe with lungs. So the first thing to do when faced with an argument you find in the wild like that is to first translate the statements into standard form, i.e. into A-I-E-R-O's. And so this becomes all mammals are lung breathers, and all whales are mammals, so all whales breathe with lungs. And then we put it into standard syllogistic form. Now in the next lecture, I'm going to show you a whole procedure for taking something like this and putting it into standard syllogistic form, but that's not what we're focusing on right now. I just want you to see that now we have uh, an argument in standard syllogistic form, and our model syllogism has three distinct terms, which are defined in it should be R, right? Which are defined in terms of the conclusion, which contains two of the syllogism's three terms. So always when you look at a syllogism, look at the conclusion and sort of label the subject and predicate. Put an S and a P on top of the, of the subject and predicate terms, the minor term and the major term. Remember that the predicate of the conclusion is the major term, the subject of the conclusion is the minor term, so the remaining terms will be the middle term. So now we can label the whole syllogism. So labeling that allows us to label that and that and that and that. We can then label our premises if we wanted to or identify them. The major premise is the premise with the major term. The minor premise is the premise with the minor term. And then what's left over is the middle term, and there we have our conclusion. We can then give the schema, as Aristotle called it, of the syllogism, what we would call its universal form. Now note that Aristotle uses the three capital letters, S, P, and M, for his variables. And that will, we will use this when giving the univer universal form of the syllogism instead of our P's, Q's, and R's, uh, an homage to the great Aristotle. And so there we have a fully identified and sort of a fully identified syllogism, right? We have the universal form or the schema, all M or P, all S or M, all S are P. So to sum up, let's look at this again. In a standard form syllogism, the major premise is always listed first. And the major premise contains the major term which is the predicate term of the conclusion. The minor premise contains the minor term, which is the subject term of the conclusion. And there's the subject term of the conclusion, and there's the minor premise.
The middle term is what connects the major and the minor together. It collects them and presents the harvest of the conclusion. And you want to note that the middle term does not appear in the conclusion. So there's our middle terms. And the minor term in the minor premise is the subject term of the conclusion. So in our conclusion, we have our minor term. So that's our first step in learning about a syllogism. In our next episode, we're going to learn about what's called mood and figure. Thank you for your kind attention.